stress affects the gut in so many different ways, it, negatively, pretty much all negatively. Yeah. Um, and it's something that tends to go under the radar because everyone's stressed in some capacity and we sort of reward stress in our society, unfortunately. So yeah. a lot of times people aren't looking at that avenue. It seems so obvious sometimes too, where like people are like, oh yeah, I am st like for sure stressed, but they're not connecting the dots of it being a big driver of their SIBO or their IBS. Well, a couple fold. I've had cases um, or patients with SIBO and gastroparesis and IBS and like everything in between. And they come to me and we go through their their health history with a fine tooth comb and nothing is adding up. Like they don't have any of the other root cause triggers that I would normally fish for, but their condition was predated by some pretty awful stress. In the conventional medical community, for better or worse, they approach stress from a very dismissive place of like, ah, you're just a stress case, whatever. Like get over it, just, you know, don't be stressed. And A, it's never that simple. But B, like, it's not like you can just consciously choose to not be stressed. If you've ever talked to any human being in their life, like that's not how it happens. Um, same thing with anxiety. You can't just tell somebody with anxiety, don't be anxious. Yeah, or like, like that's chill out. Not that's work. not gonna, yeah, it's yeah. gonna probably uh, cause the opposite effect. Yeah, yeah, because they're gonna feel not heard and like they've been dismissed. And there's like a few that come to mind where it's like, oh, like, yeah, it could be like something over here. It could be something over here. And then like, we're kind of like piecing it together and they're like, they sort of say it as an afterthought. Like, oh yeah, like there was like a huge period of stress right here. And so like, usually it's not like what they're zeroing in on most of the no. time. It's it's mm -hmm. like an afterthought. So it it usually probably takes a practitioner like us who's really keen and looking closely at those comments of like, okay, wait, can you like explain what was going on? There's a lot of blind spots. And I think there's a, there's a ton of reasons for that. I think there's, we're very resistant to do stress management. That's at least what I've seen from mm -hmm. working with people. And I think even to myself, I can find that there's some periods of time where I'm way more resistant to stress management. And usually that's when I'm stressed. I find that for women, they don't know how to work it into their day if they're trying to do everything for everyone. Yeah. Um, and I think men in the other direction, like sometimes bury it deeper and like don't really yeah. acknowledge that they're stressed. Like I think women yeah. are a little bit better about knowing that they're stressed. Um, men, I feel like not quite as much from what I've seen. I don't know if that's something that you've seen. If someone's stressed to the max, I don't know if it's optimal to try to incorporate like a large volume of stress management at one time. It's like, yeah. how do you take baby steps towards the right direction? Um, and one other thing, and we'll kind of dive into this too, with stress, there's so much interaction between like the brain gut access the hormone like there's so much yes. internal stress that's happening with gut issues anyway mm -hmm. um it, and i think that's something i see too where some of the people i'm working with will tell me you know what i'm not really stressed at all like i don't think i need stress management and i'm sure there's some stressors that they're just unaware of but like even mm -hmm. the fact that you have like a chronic issue internally that's stressing your body out yeah there's like physical stress that's happening um and i think the physical stress is a really key thing to clue in on because like that encompasses like movement sunlight uh circadian mm -hmm. rhythm sleep mm -hmm. it's not just about like meditation and like what we typically think of as stress management to bubble baths like, yeah exactly to keep the systems uh aligned it has to do a lot with a lot of different things um and i think usually if you can do small tweaks in a lot of different areas you're gonna get a bigger effect than like just focusing on doing bubble baths um or like doing 30 minutes of meditation like you could do the same allotment of time mm -hmm. kind of spaced out in different areas 
and you could have a bigger effect. Yeah. Yeah, and I think also like um, just kind of evaluating your individual stressors too. Like I've definitely had scenarios and sometimes even in my personal life where I'm like, all right, does it make more sense to spend money on a gym membership or a meditation app or a meditation doodad? Or does it make more sense, like if your main stressor is poor communication with your spouse, maybe you're better off spending a couple hundred bucks on some counseling sessions. And that would net you a better result instead of buying the bath bombs and I don't know, and like going to the spa or, you know, the cliches, like maybe you could send, spend that amount of money on something that's unique to your stress. So sometimes that is lost in the conversation too. Like you could do the generic stress reduction stuff, which is great, but also like identify your biggest sources of stress and then try to tackle those to the best of your ability. Right. Like what's the cost benefit ratio to your stress management approaches. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's a really interesting point. And to kind of jump off from there, I know working with clients, sometimes there's like almost too much focus on like nailing every piece of the stress management that they don't have like any fun or pleasure. Like I almost think that that's like a big piece of it. Take it too far. Yeah. Yeah, a big piece of it too. Like I can, they're like, you know, they might be meditating 15 to 30 minutes a day. They're sleeping. They're like checking every box, but then like they, I'm talking to them and they still seem stressed. And like, you know, then I might ask them like, how do you hang out with your friends often? Like, are you engaging in um, activities and hobbies that you like? Um, Is there anything that you want to do more of that you aren't doing now currently yeah i think those are all key questions too of like maybe it's just a lack of doing things that you enjoy um and that's not to say that you have to go and like do something really intense that's like dive into some whole new thing it's more like how can you get find pleasure on a weekly basis with things fun and human connection yeah for sure but also like it orthorexia right it's that like unhealthy obsession with healthy eating and i think that the same thing could be said of just like health promoting things so the people who are overly stressed with you know i have to exercise x amount every day for you know my health and i have to do x amount of meditation a day and i have to take x amount of supplementation a day and i have to you know do whatever and it's like okay but like having all of that on your plate can actually be intrinsically stressful at times. So just like give yourself a, a week off where like you stay in your pajamas for the week or yeah, know, and like you don't meditate or work out ever. Like, for sure. Love you to look at. Um, but yeah, I think that you can go too far. It's the too much of a good thing. You can have that with health promoting things like nutrition and other health promoting things where like, Like the reason you do these things, like health promoting things is so that you can live your life the way you want to live your life. Like you, you have passions, you have goals, like you have things you want to do. If the health promoting stuff is preventing you from being able to be productive and the things that you want to, you want to do and the passions that you enjoy or the people that you enjoy, like that's not good. So um, it's almost like swapping one out for the other. Exactly. It's such a, in fu- the, the sweet spot idea is such a good way to think about it. You just want to be cautious about um, where you're drawing that line. And I think just asking yourself too, are these things serving me? Am I being productive? Am I, am I accomplishing some of the goals that I'm laying out for myself and mm-hmm. still doing the passions that I enjoy? Well, I think too, like what we probably want to touch on is just like the physiology of the stress response. Yeah. And and what that looks like. I know one of the interesting things that I'll always point out to the clients that I work with, um, there was a smaller study. I wish there was more just because I think it's fascinating that that links IBS with low vagal tone and that hmm. makes a lot of sense yeah. from our standpoint. 
Um, but oftentimes if your vagus nerve is not optimal, you're going to have a really hard time getting out of getting out of a fight or flight state. You're going to be sort of slated to be in that more yeah. sympathetic dominant state. And so a lot of times too, if you are someone that is like anxious and stressed out, um, you could have this low vagal tone issue that's really preventing you from going into a a rest and digest state, which is going to be optimal for digestion, motility, and pretty much everything digestively. Um, so I think that that's something really important to to recognize. And I know that you talk about this too. So again, it's like if you're chronically in that fight or flight, yes, your vagus nerve is going to be toast and therefore your motility is going to be toast and you're not going to make stomach acid and like your digestive juices are all going to suck. But also you're going to be giving yourself leaky gut and you're going to be giving yourself some pretty ticked off and degranulated mast cells. And then that can perpetuate things like visceral hypersensitivity and irritable bowel syndrome more broadly. And it'll, it'll keep you stuck in a freaking rut if you don't address it. And you're going to keep learning the same lessons until you you take note and you respond to them. I think that's something I'm learning in my adulthood too, is like, if something, you know, your body sends you a minor annoying signal, and then a moderate annoying signal, and then a big annoying signal, and then it's just going to start doing weird shit and just whacking away and stuff. And it's like, yeah, you know, it keeps escalating the response until you pay attention and you do something. Yeah. And it's your body kind of saying like, you knucklehead, pay attention to me. Come on. I'm stressed. Cut it out. But again, it's it's the American way and it's the way of the modern world is just like take all your stress, ball it up into a little ball and shove it down and never open it back up ever. Yeah, I mean, it's taking down your, your immune defenses. Like if your gut's yeah. permeable and it's leaky and your immune system is shot because of stress and, and the stress that's going on in the gut and the inflammation that's going on in the gut, it would make sense that there'd be a higher like virulence of these pathogens. Yeah. And again, it's it's just so crucial to like find ways to to work on some of the stress management stuff so that you can mm -hmm. can overcome some of the gut stuff. And I mean, like we were talking about before, it's just there's a lot of missed opportunities from what I've seen to to hone in on this. And it's I think a lot of times because there's so much focus on the diet piece, or which also adds stress to the equation. Yeah. Um, there's so much focus on a lot of these strategies that don't affect stress in any way, or maybe add add to stress. Like if you're just managing tons of supplements and tons of dietary restrictions, mm -hmm. that's just going to add more stress to the to the mix.